Welcome to today's webinar, Building Upon Large-Scale Brownfield Investments to Benefit Communities, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the EPA, U U U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Brownfields and Land Revitalization Office and Office of Community Revitalization and the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the M Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the U.S. EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of Smart Growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on Smart Growth and Planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. This webinar is also the first in a multi-part series sponsored by the U.S. EPA's Brownfields and Land Revitalization and Office of Community Revitalization known as Learning From and Leaning On Local Leaders to Revitalize African American Neighborhoods. Once we begin the webinars, our speakers will talk more about the series and what we'll be covering over the next several programs. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to su subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AACP credits, please visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event which is building upon large-scale brownfield investments to benefit communities. And although it's not on the screen right now, the event number today is 9220348, and we'll send that out via the chat to remind everybody later. Today's session will be introduced by David Lloyd, director of the US EPA's Office of Brownfields and Land Revitalization. Then we'll hear from Jim Vanderkloot, land revitalization coordinator for EPA Region 5. Our presenters today are Kevin Stansill, Kathy Brown, and Abraham Lacey. Kevin Stansill works at the Regional Transportation Agency Authority, excuse me, coordinating projects between the Chicago Transit Authority, Metra, and PACE. During his career, Kevin has worked in the non-for-profit public and private sectors through the Open Lands Projects, the City of Chicago Department of the Environment, the Chicago Transit Authority and Trans Systems, where he worked on transit projects in Southeast Michigan and Northwest Indiana. On the West Pullman project, Kevin was the point person on environmental issues, interacting with the community at public meetings, coordinating with local government agencies, and overseeing the environmental monitoring during the demolition on the Dutch Boy site. Kathy Brown is founder and principal at K. Brown's and Brown & Associates Consulting Limited, a specialized real estate advisory firm. Kathy Brown has more than 25 years of strategic planning, project management, and operations experience in the Chicago metropolitan area. She began her career as a coordinator of economic development for the City of Chicago's Department of Planning and Development. As a member of both Chicago Brownfields Task Force and the Tax Reactivate Reactivation Committee, she coordinated the redevelopment of environmentally challenged properties and the expansion of industry with the city's industrial corridors. As an assistant commissioner responsible for one of the city's seven planning districts, she managed all commercial and residential development within the South District. Finally, Abraham Lacey is the president and chief executive officer of the Far South Community Development Corporation, also known as the Far South CDC. Since 2011, he has generated more than $14 million in grants and operating funds for the agency. He has helped hundreds of businesses and residents on Chicago's South Side by establishing an Illinois Small Business Development and Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, a HUD-certified housing counseling agency, 
a number of urban planning projects and single family home renovations. We'll also be posting uh, longer uh, bios for each of the presenters today on our archive page. Following their presentations, our panelists will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. So before we go into the program itself, we're going to begin with a few polls as we often do. If you're unable to respond to any of these, you may need to exit from full screen mode. The first one is the one we usually start with, which is just asking everybody where you are from today. And you have five choices. West, Midwest, South, Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, or International. And we'll give you a few seconds to respond. And if you can, if you have any trouble responding to that, please uh, exit full screen mode. We'll leave this open for a couple seconds and then move to the next one. And it looks like we have quite a nice uh, distribution geographically today. So thank you all for uh, being here as well as participating in the polls, because this is good information, both I think for the people watching today, as well as for the panelists in terms of who is here with us. So we'll close the poll and share that. 31% are in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast, 25% the South, 24% Midwest, 16% West, and 5% of our, our audience is international today. I'm going to move into the next question. And what is your primary profession? So you have uh, five options. We know there are more, but we just try to, we're limited to five. So generally, architect, engineer, landscape architect is one, planner, transportation planner is two, researcher, teacher, professor is three, urban designer is four, and other is five. We are often heavily um, represented by planners, but it's often interesting to see what percentage is planners. And uh, we're quite, looks like we'll be pretty close to what we usually attract for our planning specific topics. So we'll show the response here. And so 52% of the audience today are planners, 33% are other, so that's interesting. 8% architect, engineer, landscape architect, 4% researcher, teacher, professor, and 3% urban designer. Next question here for you all today is what type of agency do you work for? So public, private, not-for-profit, academic, or other? And again, thanks for participating in these polls today. This is good information for us. Again, uh, some of this may affect how the presenters frame some of their comments. So it's very useful for everybody for you to participate in this. And again, we'll leave this open for a few seconds and a couple more questions um, that will get a little bit more specific as we move forward here. So we'll close this poll and see that 68% public, 20% private, 7% not-for-profit, 2% academic, 3% other. Okay, fourth question here is, have you been involved in issues of Brownfield's environmental justice and or racial equity? And this is a yes or no question. So we'll give you a few seconds to respond to this. And again, thank you for doing so. It's always interesting to see um, what the responses are. Sometimes can be surprising. And a couple more seconds and we'll close it. It's like a lot of folks are responding right now, which is great. We'll close this one up. And so we'll see 64% yes, 36% no. And finally, if you answered yes to the previous question, did your work address other elements of the public realm? And then you can select, if that's so, all of which apply here, public health, community centers, schools or libraries, retail or job creation, or I should say and, because you can respond to multiple. And again, thank you for doing that. I think we'll you'll see the relevance as we move forward in the presentation. We'll just leave this open a couple more seconds 
just to see that, and this one's interesting because unlike some of the other ones where we may be able to guess based on the audience what the responses might be, I think this one is, does delve a little bit more specifically into what's been going on within your community. So um, I think that's very interesting for us to see that. So in this case, 59% public health, 47% uh, job creation, 39% community centers, 24% retail, and 21% schools and libraries. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Lloyd to kick us off today. Welcome, David. Yes, thank you very much. Um, let me know if you're having any problems hearing me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, to introduce this series of webinars. And I want to thank uh, Jim Vanderkloot specifically for his work organizing this for us. Um, the key points that I want to make just as introductions is that this webinar is going to really underscore uh, the core priorities of the Biden administration and the EPA Brownfields program and I know also the Office of Community Revitalization uh, are thrilled to have this new leadership and uh, their embrace of our mission. As was said, my name is David Lloyd. I'm the director of the office, EPA's Office of Brownfields and Land Revitalization. As most of you know, the Brownfields program has a long history stretching back to the mid-1990s and over the years, we've really success, successfully coordinated with many of you on issues of smart growth and the built environment. Um, today, we're gonna talk about the intersection of these with racial equity. Again, a priority of this uh, administration. Many of our nation's brownfields uh, are located in African-American neighborhoods. Uh, that's, that's the fact. And they, we think there's so much we can learn from these communities and their past successes and their failures. And the lessons of the past can really help inform the hard work of the future. Since I've been serving as the uh, office director for the Brownfields program, I began in 2006. I've worked with many communities that have encountered the challenges we're going to hear about today from colleagues uh, in Chicago and the other panelists. We're excited to be part of this webinar as it highlights the core issues, as I said, that are the priorities of the Biden administration and high level, I'll just list the four, identifying environmental hazards and areas that require cleanup, highlighting environmental justice and equity to guide action, investing in infrastructure and job creation in underserved communities, and revitalization of neglected neighborhoods that have brownfield sites. I'm personally very excited about these priorities. The Brownfields program has been a key tool to address issues of environmental justice and racial equity in the past. And we're gonna put our shoulders into implementing the Biden administration's priorities with great enthusiasm. On a very practical level, Brownfield's resources and technical assistance can be used to support community-driven activities, such as those that are gonna be described in today's webinar. For example, the West Pullman community has successfully brought, to, brought a broad range of funding and tools to bear to provide better quality of life for its residents. I'm thrilled that Brownfield Resources, through loaned personnel and a large Section 108 loan guarantee, were key components in what I view as a very notable success on a national scale. We can learn from this story, and it will help us spot future opportunities to support the same principles as they arrive. In general terms, here's how Brownfield Resources uh, can help future efforts that combine community revitalization, racial equity, and the built environment. I'm almost done. Community leaders can use an individual brownfield project and funding to introduce ways to tackle hood neighborhoods where blight persists and where and properties are abandoned and to bring justice where environmental injustice exists. Secondly, brownfields job training can help counter job loss and bring new skills and employment prospects that meet local market needs and give new chances and hope to the unemployed. Third, through an understanding of the issues relating to smart growth in the built environment, brownfield resources help address the environmental challenges and can help bring the needed quality of life improvements for healthier, safer living. I wanna thank you again for joining us, joining me and the others rather, as we listen to local leaders on their work with brownfields and revitalization for a fairer future. 
And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, one of uh, really a national leader in brownfields revitalization, Jim Vanderkloot. Thank you. Hey, Jim, you're muted. Thank you. Go ahead. So before we get started, I'm going to address the question that's probably on your mind is that, yes, David Lloyd does insist that we wear glasses with clean, with clear, uh, clear plastic frames as we give our presentations. <laughs> the, um, my name is Jim Vanderkloot. I'm with EPA's Chicago office in the Brownfields program, and I'm your facilitator. This is the first of a six part series focused on long term revitalization strategies in African American neighborhoods with lessons learned from those who led the projects. The first webinar starts with a large brownfield investment, but subsequent webinars will focus on other themes. Recent publications such as The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein and Andre Perry's Know Your Price have gotten many of us at EPA thinking about how we can improve our approach to community work. If you haven't read these books, they're highly recommended because they help to provide a fuller understanding of the damage done by historic federal, state, and local laws and policies in African-American communities and provide a context for the work that needs to be done. Our series will bring forward case studies started during the last two to four decades. You'll from a series of these stories from African-American communities where great progress has been made towards improving uh, quality of life for the people who live there. Hear about the roles of leadership, nonprofits, government, churches, and local players, and also start a discussion about getting access to emerging tools that can help communities now while respecting the lessons of the past. These case studies are intended to our dialogue and to help us all learn from each other and we hope this generates um, other stories to be told. Many thanks to our hosts today, uh, Maryland Department of Planning, Michael Baer and John Coleman, Regina Langton and EPA's Office of Community Revital Revitalization, the Smart Growth Network, and to my Brownfields colleagues, particularly uh, Amy Storm and Ann Carroll. A special thanks to Sarah Gruza in uh, in Chicago office of EPA, who's been working uh, with me on putting this web webinar series together. So here's the top of webinar number one. So three of us here today, myself and our first two speakers, worked together in the mid 90s in putting together the Chicago Brownfields Initiative, which was the first program of its kind in the country. It was a very exciting time. We had a fantastic team at the city of Chicago. Brownfields was a brand new concept and everything went our way for three years and it was a total blast. I, um, I was on loan from US EPA to the Department of Environment. Kevin Stanziel was with the Chicago Department of Environment at the time and Kathy Brown was with the Chicago Department of Planning and Development and played a key role in work in this, in this community. Kevin and Kathy will tell the story of the early years of the project and then hand it over to Abraham, Abraham Lacey the, the, of the Far South Community Development Agency who will wow you with stories of what has been done and is being done in this community. This was one of the nation's first very large investments in brownfields. There was an initial investment of $20 million. So it is interesting to return to the project now to see what has happened in the subsequent 25 years. This is a very active community that is blessed with strong leadership and uh, with that, I will hand it over to Kevin Stanziel. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Kevin, swap screen. Thank you. There we go. Nope, screen. you have to share your screen. You turn screen sharing off. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, so. All right. Trying to turn it back on there. Sorry about that. 
All right, am I good? We're not seeing any slides. Okay. Uh, show, here we go. All right, thank you. I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm Kevin Stansill. I am currently with the, uh, as, as was mentioned, the Regional Transportation Authority in Chicago. But at the time of the work we were doing in West Pullman, I worked at the City of Chicago Department of Environment um, as an assistant commissioner. I had started my work there working on clean projects, working on parks and open space. But um, when Jim came aboard, they moved us to what we called, you know, the contaminated program issue, which I'll speak on a little bit. Um, we, in 1993, we brought together an interdepartmental team to clean up and redevelop brownfield sites. This was a new issue, and we were the first city to do such a program. Since the term brownfields was rather new, we often had to call the sites something along the lines of environmentally contaminated sites that are not super fun sites, which means they really aren't that bad. So the federal government won't clean them up or something along those lines, because we didn't have a key term like brownfield. Our team consisted of the departments of environment, planning, and development, buildings, housing, law, and the mayor's office. Three of these departments were there specifically for lawyers that covered building, housing, and real estate. And I must say, even to this day, it was just such a pleasure to work with the team that worked that well together. Uh, the budget office provided us a budget of $2 million, and we set about identifying five pilot sites. We were looking for real, and, real estate transactions that were impeded by environmental issues. As it turns out, four of the five pilot sites were located in African-American neighborhoods. Those of you who have read The Color of Law will not be surprised to learn that the greatest concentration of abandoned industrial sites in the city of Chicago are found in African-American neighborhoods. I first learned of this issue when I was a local lead person in the early 90s, when, in the early 90s when Al Gore came to visit. And at that time, I met Hazel Johnson, who was one of the early leaders in the environmental justice movement. And she explained to me what environmental justice was and what the term toxic donut meant. So these five sites went on pretty well based upon what it would cost to do Superfund cleanups. And that was according to Jim, because he was the only one that had experience with those sorts of things. We'd assumed that our budget would pay for testing of five sites and the cleanup of two. As it turns out, we were able to move all five sites into redevelopment for only $1 million. This helped educate the real estate market in Chicago of the possibilities. At the same time, we put on the Chicago Brownfields Forum, which brought together 130 people from a broad range of fields to systematically address the Brownfields issue. It was cheered jointly by the commissioner of the Department of Environment, the late Henry Henderson, and the commissioner of the, of the Department of Planning and Development, Valerie Jarrett. An Illinois state voluntary cleanup program and a wide range of liability clarifications for local governments and lenders came out of this, and it helped change the marketplace. I also got some fun out of that because, because of that, the Illinois EPA purchased a couple of drills so they could do sampling. And it was, pretty, it was pretty fun on my part to actually go out in the field with them to do the sampling of some of these low-level contaminated sites. As you can imagine, coming in 50% under budget got the attention of the mayor's office and the budget office. We started looking at some larger areas of brownfields within the city, and the largest district of brownfields was the West Pullman neighborhood, which is on the far south side of Chicago. Our interdepartmental team was able to provide the justification to the budget office so that they could take out a $54 million HUD Section 108 loan guarantee. 20 million of this was designated towards the West Pullman area and its 176 acres of brownfields. This funding came through in 1996, and it started the ball rolling, as you will hear from our subsequent speakers. The graphic here, if you're wondering, is of Scott Peterson Polishes. They were one of our, of our four pilot locations. Scott Peterson had a facility with an old streetcar barn across the street from their factory, and they wanted to expand onto that site. We cleaned the site up, and then we transferred the site to the company for their use. 
Here's the West Pullman neighborhood on the on the on the south side on the far south side of Chicago, and it's west of the historic Pullman neighborhood. It's uh it's a middle class community with involved homeowners. In the middle of West in the middle of West Pullman, has a medium sized manufacturing base in Miller area. It has a metro rail line adjacent to the south, and metro is the um, local commuter railroad here. And it, which provided workers for e easy transportation to their jobs when it was when it when it was when it was working when they had a lot of people there. This right here is an aerial of the area from 1938 as the manufacturing just started to fill in. The status of this area in the early 1990s was extremely different. At that time, most of these factories were blighted. The area was open to fly dumpers, and it was just unsightly. It was just acres of land, and it's surrounded by a nice middle class neighborhood. Driving down 115th Street, which was the main thoroughfare which split the factories, it was just depressing with all the buildings colla collapsing and all of the overgrown vegetation. This would not be the case in most middle class communities in America, but in communities of color, this is close to the north. I actually had friends who lived near there, um, just north of there. And when they heard I was working on cleaning up the sites, they were static. They felt that just cleaning up would be an improvement. But working on brownfields, we felt that our work was more than just cleaning up locations, but to set up the properties for future improvements. This area shows the area after the factories, the factory decline began. There were several major cleanups already underway here, particularly the International Harvester site, um, which is in the middle, which is on the lower part of that, which was in ruins, and the adjacent Dutch Boys site, which actually had a standing structure. I was a staff overseeing the monitoring of the Dutch Boys site when the city demolished it. This brought me into constant contact with the Victory Heights Maple Park community. It was at that point in time that we determined that there was a lot of community interest in this and other sites in the area. So we set up a citizens, a citizens advisory committee consisting of representatives of churches, block clubs, the chamber of commerce, and just general residents. Let me say that the community helped bring attention to these properties. They originally organized on environmental issues when a city salt pile, uh, that's for all of us up north, you know, Chicago's known for just salting its city streets like crazy and we get snow. So they had a huge salt pile just southwest of this, of this site and it was not covered. So it would blow salt into the neighborhood. So once they got the attention of the press on this, they built upon this and helped make our case for bringing more resources into the area. For a few months, I was out there every Saturday morning for public meetings. At first, I felt bad at times, but the community was concerned and, and, and they really wanted answers. And now the government was bringing resources, they felt that they could get those answers. So we began regular meetings with the groups and, and members of the group committed to communicating with their individual constituencies and a channel feedback to this, to this, to this group. Sorry about that. Um, this was a very important element of providing clear feedback and response to the community. Little that we know, really, little that this that we started something that would prove to be useful, and that the regular meetings would proceed through over a ten-year period. While I left working on this in 1997, I still I still knew what was going on because I often worked with the with the 34th Ward Auditor. Alderman Kerry Austin, who's the local elected official in my new position at the Chicago Transit Authority. And whenever I would meet with her, she would always bring up this project and what they were doing there. The cleanup within the district was extensive and the city had to call in the US EPA emergency response to deal with the contamination at several buildings before we could proceed to address the remaining contamination with the Brownfields funding. Here's what the area looks like now. This is a recent area. A friend of mine from high school actually was one of the initial managers of the solar panel facility, which you see on the, on the bottom there, which was installed by Exelon on the former International Harvester site. I actually, before the presentation, I actually called him up and just started talking about it. 
um, because he, he left a while ago and he said, you know, it was really nice working there. And that he said they received a subsidy because it was located on the brownfield site. And it now provides 10 megawatts for electricity to serve in 1500 homes. And Abraham will speak a lot more about this and other things later. So here's a few observations. Things worked in West Pullman because the residents were committed and organized and they were a very tight community. With our work on the pilot sites, we had a proven track record on working in communities of color. And then finally, you need great support from a local, sector, local elected officials. And, you know, and Kathy and Abraham will talk about that a lot more as we go on. Now, for me, things have come full circle. For the past four years, I've been on a local, a local community committee set up by my office. Um, she set up an advisory committee to develop a 100-acre parcel and an adjacent 75 parcels next to that along Chicago's South Lakefront. We were all local residents selected for our professional and, and our, for our professional and personal work. And this advisory committee works with a developer chosen by the city and many of the same departments that I just mentioned. This project, like many large sites in African-American neighborhoods, does have brownfield issues. It's a, it has a seven-acre seven portion of it that's been capped for decades that has a radium, thorium, and uranium contamination, which the city has just started cleaning up this month. My experience in this work on that project just strengthened my views of what I learned from the work we did in West Point. The key thing is educating and involving communities on cleanup and redevelopment of their communities. With that, I will now hand things over to Kathy. Kathy, we don't see your slides, we see your browser. You see my browser, okay. Uh, do you have a PowerPoint open right now? Yes, I do. Yes, I, uh, let's see. Yes, I do. Okay, now go to full slides. Okay. Under slideshow, yeah, all the way to the left. Okay. Do you see oh. them? Yep. Great, great. Thank you. So my name is Kathy Brown. And I was the former, was a former uh, coordinator of economic development for the city of Chicago's Department of Planning and Development. I came, or I was introduced to this project in West Pullman in the mid 90s uh, when the newly appointed alderman, alderman of the 34th Ward, Carrie Austin, um, visited our department. Um, I honestly want to think this is probably one of the first departments that she met with. Um, the background with this is that the EPA and IPA, IEPA were on site. They were working with the DuPont and the International Harvester sites. And the community, Victory Heights and Maple Park, um, were very concerned, not only about the environmental work that was going on, but the future reuse um, that the city was, was working towards. So the alderman asked us to take a look at the redevelopment potential for the site. Um, and she, she specifically asked us to take a look at the commercial uh, development potential. I think looking back on this, um, the community uh, was not afraid really of industrial development. It's that they did not want the kind of industrial development that had been there in the late 80s or late 70s or late 80s. So the idea is if industrial won't work, take a look at the commercial component of it. I think the general thing that I left with after that first meeting was we want to see economic development, but we want to ensure that it doesn't occur at the expense of the health and safety of the community. So having, uh, having said that, the Department of Planning and Development, along with its partner, uh, Department of Environment, we set about to do our due diligence in an initial site assessment for the property. 
this is a, a slide currently of what the industrial area looked like, oh, years ago, um, maybe the light, late 70s, 80s. And this is what we found when we went out. The site uh, currently, as you see it, is about 210 acres. On the north, it's bounded by 115th, 119th Street, generally. Uh, on the south, it's bounded by 122nd Street. On the east, it's bounded by Halstead here. And on the west, it's bounded approximately by Loomis. My colleague, Kevin, mentioned that um, there was a very, very active and beautiful um, community surrounding each of these. I'm gonna take my cursor, I hope you can see this, but the Maple Park community would be west of 119th Street and Victory Heights would be south. So if you take a look at the map here, this is the industrial area outlined and you can see the density of housing um, that we found when we went out here in, I think it's gotta be about 1996 or 1997. This actually is a photograph that I took recently. Uh, it does not look different except you have a few newer trees here. Um, but this is what the blocks adjacent to the site looked like when we went out. So I'll go back to the slide. What we found, again, um, I've gone over the boundaries of the site, but what we found in terms of condition, uh, there were a variety of industrial buildings of varying size and condition on the site. Many of these properties were vacant or underutilized. I think the largest industrial facilities that currently operated there were Ingersoll and US Gear. They were still operating, although with a minimal staff. Uh, the remaining manufacturing structures, structures, either occupied or unoccupied, were smaller, rectangular configurations, and they were probably built in the mid 1950s or 60s. We still had also structural elements remaining from the International Harvester and Dutch Boy and Amford site, which you will see. This would be the Harvester site. This is the Ingersoll property, and this is the Amford property. In terms of employment, in contrast to the thousands of folks that worked here um, in the late 80s, you had approximately 330 employees here. And again, with Ingersoll having about 160 um, and U.S. Gear having about 70. The users, the smaller users that operated on the site were concentrated in the lower or southern portion of the site. And you had various metal uh, fabricators, welding um, fabricators, and they were active, but they were smaller employers. In terms of infrastructure, um, this site is unique in that it provided, um, probably being the largest site that we've got on the south side is what our Brownfields work showed us, but it provided vehicular traffic via, or access to vehicular, uh, uh, with vehicular and truck traffic on, uh, one, I'm sorry, on 119th Street and on 120th Street here, we see that we have access that goes through the park and that's primarily for trucks. The site also has, uh, is served by three CTA bus routes and you have the Metra commuter lines that serve, that actually there are two stops that serve the site as well. The site itself is approximately a hundred, I'm sorry, it's about 1.5 acres or miles from the I-57 interchange and you can access that via uh, 119th Street. There's also three rail lines that run through this site. So while, and while we were assessing this site, I'd like to say that the Department of Environment, uh, they were doing a similar assessment of the site. Um, Department of Environment at that time, about 1996, had ordered a phase one environmental assessment, site assessment of the site. And the idea was to provide a broad source of information regarding the environmental conditions of specific properties. So armed with that data, um, the Department of Planning and Development, we looked at this and we proposed uh, a West, the West Pullman Industrial Park Conservation Area TIF. And some folks say, well, you know, why, why are you going down the same path? And based upon our experience with the five pilot sites, 
frankly, on the south and west sides of Chicago, we had not seen a site of this size, this magnitude um, on the south side. And, and with the, this type of infrastructure and uh, workforce. So we presented this to the alderman um, and she said, all right, let's try and I will bring this back to the community, which she did. The site itself, um, again, well suited to industry. Um, and we thought that if we could update the infrastructure, we could develop a more modern industrial high technology kind of a park. So the TIF was designated in 1997. And what this TIF allowed us to do was acquisition and demolition, environmental remediation, infrastructure improvements and engineering, marketing, employment and training, and development assistance. Um, the first step, once this was des designation was in place, was to start to catalog and appraise the vacant and underutilized buildings. Taking into consideration any environmental issues with the particular properties, we also acquired properties through direct offers to property owners, the tax reactivation program, which allowed us to acquire parcels um, that were delinquent in taxes. We later began to acquire properties, uh, I think, in uh, recent years through the Cook County Land Bank. We also acquire properties through donation and leasing. I think that uh, the property that the Exelon site sits on is a leasehold. Um, we also used our eminent domain authorities. Where appropriate, we used those TIF funds to demolish uh, the remaining structures. Um, specifically, I think the Amforge facility was a city demolition um, and we used it to clean up sites. In total, I think the city acquired 85 acres of land on this site. In terms of infrastructure, the city completed about $7 million in infrastructure improvements. Specifically, um, 119th Street and 120th Street were reconstructed to accommodate both vehicular and truck traffic. A fiber optic, optics system was put in place. The, the area has new lights. Um, we did new water and sewer on the site and industrial uses were separated from the residential uses. As a part of the TIF plan, um, there's also a marketing plan. It was determined that as sites are cleaned up, they would be marketed. Um, and also we partnered with the city of Chicago, uh, city, well, city colleges of Chicago to develop a comprehensive training program for any new industry that comes to the site. And finally, what we were able to do was offer financial incentives for existing property owners and redevelopers, uh, those interested in coming to the site. In addition, while we were working, I think the Department of Environment designated, they assisted us greatly in de uh, designating certain properties um, within the district. They were designated um, and categorized and prioritized for remediation. They also established a program to achieve regulatory compliance as the cleanup occurs. This program would establish a method of compliance and approval that allowed building construction, which was important to us to occur on the sites concurrently um, with final rem remediation. As we moved um, and worked through this planning and environmental process, uh, it was determined that certain specific remediation would be best if accomplished with actual site development. So I think at that point, um, Kevin and I were kind of locked together here um, in, in looking at sites, categorizing them, um, and seeking additional users for those sites. In terms of the financing and the impact um, of community engagement, as mentioned, there was a HUD 108 loan guarantee of $20 million. We used TIF resources. Um, there was an EDA grant that we utilized to replace infrastructure. And we also worked with private funding, uh, new market tax credits, and tax abatements. In terms of the projects that we have here, MyFab 
uh, which is located at 1321 West 119th Street. This is a provider of engineering and plumbing drainage solutions. Uh, they built a $13 million facility. They received a tax fee and a land right down from the city. You have here in the lower right-hand corner, uh, the Croc Center. Now this is over $200 million project. And this was built on the former Amforge property, which is just north of 119th Street. I think there was about a $5 million cleanup and I believe the city demolished this building. Um, this 127,000 square foot facility with recreation, um, performing arts facilities, uh, theater fitness centers. It has a membership of approximately 8,000 community residents and 1,500 visitors every day. Now in the top right-hand corner, you have the West Pullman Library. It's a full service branch, about 14,000 square feet. Um, this was a $4 million project and $2 million was uh, supplied by the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. And then finally, we have the um, Exelon solar panel. And this is a, I know my colleagues mentioned this briefly and I'm sure Abraham is going to elaborate on this, but what I find interesting about this project, um, as one of the first major projects to go on to the site, the local leadership was very interested in making sure that those um, companies, suppliers within the industrial park had an opportunity to work with them. So the metal tubing that went to build um, the solar panels, that was actually fabricated by one of the businesses in the industrial area. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Abraham Lacey, and he's gonna talk about what I've come to call the halo effect. Thank you, Kathy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abraham Lacey. I am the president and CEO of the Far South Community Development Corporation. We are a 501c3 Illinois not-for-profit corporation located on Chicago's far south side neighborhood of West Pullman. Since 1977, our mission uh, is to alleviate low-income communities within Chicago's far south side and south suburban Cook County of poverty, blight, and economic distress through effective economic and community development. The organization achieves this through three main pillars, business services, community and housing services, and development and planning. I'm excited today, today to be a part of a dynamic panel of individuals uh, who have dedicated their lives to public service throughout the years that have paved the way for generations to benefit from their efforts. Their foundation has resulted in the health and wellness of the entire community, spurred economic development, and enhanced the quality of life. Throughout the years, our organization has been part of some of the past activities mentioned um, in Kevin and Kathy's presentation and are involved in current area developments and opportunities. The presentation discussion items are categorized that you see on the screen here in four topic areas. Number one, commercial and recreation and industrial. Some of these that my colleagues have already been over. Number two, institutional and public infrastructure. Number three, housing development. And number four, planning and slash future opportunities for the West Pullman and the greater Roseland neighborhoods. The investment impact is estimated for, for previous efforts and current slash planned future opportunities are nearly 2.4 billion since the mid 90s to the projected 2035. Over the last 25 years, West Pullman and the greater Rosa neighborhoods have experienced various developments that would literally take me more than 20 minutes to discuss. But with the, the time that I have, I will point out five major investments in commercial, recreation, and industrial developments that have helped provide an anchor for West Pullman and a catalyst for other developments throughout the, the greater Roseland and West Pullman neighborhood. Some of these anchors have been mentioned by my colleagues, Kevin and Kathy, so I will not go too deep in detail about these specific developments, but mention the impact it's had on the neighborhood. The first one is the Maple Park Mini Plaza, which is about four blocks south of the, I mean, north of the 119th Street site. 
is a 3.36 acre convenience shopping center located at the southwest corner of 115th and Halstead Street in the West Pullman neighborhood. The site anchored with Aldi's food store, which announced in 2017 that it will go completely organic over the next five years. Uber Rideshare Company committed to a five-year investment of $1.7 million to address affordable transportation for riders on Chicago's far south side, which has currently, before it opened, had 500 driver partners in West Pullman, which they have earned a half a million dollars in the prior three months before the support uh, of the grant of the center opened uh, in, back in 2017. The Pullman, and also is home to the Pullman Bank and Trust uh, uh, Company. The site leveraged tax increment financing funds for site remediation due to the prior industrial plumbing company, and the plaza houses our team, our 19-member team staff as well. Marshfield Plaza Shopping Center is a half a million square foot regional shopping center built on top of the former Libby Canning factory. This is one of the largest shopping plazas on Chicago's far south side. The center is anchored by the new 130,000 square foot Blue Cross Blue Shield call center. The Jewel Osco Retail Store, Burlington Coat Factory, Old Navy and LA Fitness. With a total budget of $120 million that included environmental cleanup, the center created 850 construction jobs and over 1,260 retail jobs. It will generate millions of dollars in sales uh, and, and sales tax revenue for the city annually, and is a retail anchor for not only just West Pullman and Roseland, but Morgan Park, Calumet Park, Blue Island, and the eastern portion of Alzheimer's. The Ray Jones Croc Center, which Kathy and, and Kevin both mentioned in their presentation, is a 34-acre recreation center. It uh, was largely contributed by the Ray and Jerome Kroc Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Salvation Army, and the Chicago Bulls. The project, uh, although it was not really eligible for TIF funds, but utilized $20 million through the New Market Tax Credit Program, which incentivizes uh, community development through economic growth using tax credits to attract private investment in distressed communities. The project has created nearly 300 construction jobs and 225 permanent jobs and generated an economic impact of 14 million between 2012 and 2017. The MyFab industrial expansion, as Kathy mentioned, is a manufacturing commercial industrial plumbing and drainage products. In 2019, MyFab expanded its current footprint by adding an additional 68,000 square feet of uh, uh, into its footprint. Uh, with the assistance of TIF funds and the Class 6B property tax incentive program that Kathy mentioned before, which offers a 12-year reduction in real estate assessments from the standard Cook County industrial rate of 25%. Qualifying properties such as this one are assessed at 10% of the first 10, for the first 10 years, 15% for the 11th year, and 20% for the 12th year. The new site uh, expansion increased jobs to about uh, anywhere from 30 to 40 new permanent jobs for West Pullman residents. As mentioned other uh, prior, um, the excellent urban solar farm, uh, the property which sits on the former International Harvester site was cleared of 40 acres of toxic waste. The 32,000 photovoltaic panels sit at grade level and generates a nominal 10 megawatts of electricity for 1,500 homes. The project costs nearly $60 million and was part of the 2008 economic stimulus funds uh, due to the recession. Our next category is the institution of public infrastructure. Thanks to the leadership of Alderperson Kerry Austin of the 34th Ward in the city of Chicago, West Pullman and the areas in West Rosen neighborhood has benefited from nearly 36.3 million in institutional and public infrastructure. Now, of course, this is just a snapshot of the numerous investments made over the last 25 years. However, these are four significant highlights that has impacted the community, starting with first, the streetscape program. The city of Chicago, through uh, the Chicago Department of Transportation, CDOT streetscape program, West Pullman and, and the Greater Rosen neighborhood experienced new raised medians and planting areas along South Halstead Street. And additionally, new bike paths and LED lighting was installed along South Halstead Street uh, and 119th Street in West Pullman. The West Pullman Library Branch, as Kathy mentioned, the library was developed in 2005 through the efforts of Senator Emil Jones III, 
Mayor Richard M. Daley, and all the person Carrie Austin. The 14,000 square foot facility was supported by $4 million from the city and provided an institutional and academic learning center for residents living in West Pullman. The library hosts family fun day activities every weekend that are free to the public and seats about 125 people. The West Pullman Fire Station opened in March 2021. After 15 years of failed attempts to get the new fire station built on Chicago's far south side, West Pullman finally celebrated a new $30 million facility on the northwest corner of 119th Street and Morgan Street. Built on a former uh, Ingersoll-owned site, engine company 115, 115 supports two fire engines, one tower ladder, two advanced life support ambulances, a radio communications tower for the city's Office of Emergency Management and Communications, an EMS field chief, and a deputy district chief. The firehouse is located to allow for rapid response to both Interstate 57 and 94 and will reduce dead spots in police and fire communications that have been a major issue in the past. 55% of the businesses involved in the project were minority-owned and women-owned businesses. 15 skilled trade workers from West Pullman, Rosen, Washington Heights, and Morgan Park were part of the team. $12 million worth of work went to 17 African-American design and construction firms, and 1.7 million went to Latino construction firms, and 560,000 went to five women-owned businesses. The Major Taylor Trail, named after uh, named in 2007 after the historic African-American Marshall Major Taylor, who won seven world records in cycling in 1899, which is the, the trail is a six mile trail that runs north to south through seven neighborhoods, including West Pullman and connected to the Cal Sag Trail. The trail covers a defunct rail line, which, has, which was used in the past as racial dividing line and dumping ground that presented a danger to the neighborhoods it crossed. Through the work of the city of Chicago, Friends of the Major Taylor Trail and the community, and and the Community and Neighborhood Improvement Projects, or CNIP, the trail was cleaned thoroughly, new bike path, street layering, and LED lights in certain areas, and a new 400-foot mural in 2018 along the bridge that crosses the Calumet River that documents the life of Marshall Major Taylor. The next section is the, in, our, in our category is the housing development. The city, along with community partners, including our organization, set out on an ambitious journey to address the housing needs of various generational challenges. Over the years, the area has seen an increase of over 480 units of new housing, ranged from senior housing to single family homes. Nearly $100 million in development over the last 20 years through various programs have been used and have, been proven, have proven results to address senior transitions and generate African-American wealth. I will not talk about every last one of these projects, but I will point out the five uh, that are currently ongoing and what they've done in the past. First, starting with the 105th and Vincennes residential homes, known as the, the Homes of Beverly Ridge, was a site home to the Chicago Ridge and Ironworks Company in 1940. The industrial company involved, moved out uh, in 1976 uh, and have been vacant for nearly 30 years before 2005 when, when former NFL player Patrick Terrell and John Mayer Jr. planned a $46 million project with 250 new single-family homes on nearly 40, 58 acres. The plans quickly changed as the cost of remediating the site was costly and the 2008 recession hit. But in 2014, the project was transferred to another developer. To date, 61 new single-family homes have been developed with plans to continue the new development once the city identifies additional partners and uh, developers. Uh, families moving in will receive special financing for first-time home buyers with a 3% down payment and no private mortgage insurance. Next is the Kennedy Jordan Manor Senior Housing. It's a 63,500 square foot, 79 unit facility offering residents, residents who are 55 years and older, a safe and affordable home with a variety of, uh, of quality services and activities. The $16.5 million senior housing was conceived and implemented in 2014 by Sheldon Heights Church of Christ. We have a church campus four blocks north of the senior mm -hmm. housing. The site sits adjacent to the Major Taylor Trail along South Halstead Street uh, uh, near 118th Street. The project utilized 1.5 million in TIF funds. The Chicago Neighborhood Stabilization Program and the Micro Market Recovery Program uh, Rehab Program uh, was established federally uh, through the Neighborhood Stabilization Program for the purpose of providing emergency assistance to stabilize communities with high rates of abandoned foreclosed homes. U.S. Congress appropriated three rounds of NSP funding. Chicago received an allocation from the Neighborhood Stabilization Program and formulated specific target areas 
called the micro market recovery program areas. The micro market recovery program areas assist in rebuilding distressed communities by reducing the cost of home ownership, creating communities of choice, and attracting new homeowners to the vacant buildings on targeted blocks. West Pullman became a micro market recovery program target area uh, focused on in, in 2012 between 115th Street and 119th Street and received nearly 3 million in single family home renovation funds and 1 million in down payment assistance to residents with household incomes um, below 80% area median income as established by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and weatherization funds for existing owner occupied residents. Since 2012, there have been over 69 reoccupations with a 70 square, within a 70 square block area. Habitat for Humanity Homes in 2011 set out a journey to develop affordable single family homes in West Pullman near 119th Street and Union, east of Halstead Street. Through its affordable home ownership program, applicants undergo a 12 to 18 month process, which they are required to attend and complete the home buyer at university and perform at least 250 volunteer hours in the neighborhood. Applicants also have the choice to pitch in on the construction of their home, of the homes alongside other habitat workers and volunteers. Graduates of the program will have the opportunity of purchasing a home through the habitat financing. Each home cost does not exceed 150,000 and the owner's mortgage cannot exceed 30% of the household income, which is important about uh, building uh, African-American wealth. Habitat plans to build 60 to 80 new homes in West Pullman. And lastly, the Veterans Transition Housing was the former 110,000 square foot West Pullman Elementary School that was shut down in 2013 as a part of the 49 plus school closings across South and West sides of Chicago. The school is a historic Chicago landmark, which was built by George Pullman in three parts in 1894, 1900, and 1923. The school was auctioned off to Celadon Holdings Inc., whose, whose owner, Scott Henry, a former resident of the community, repurposed the school to a six unit affordable veterans transition housing to address the neighborhood's veterans homelessness. The exterior of the building is preserved, renovated, and restored, mandated by the Chicago landmark requirements. The project used a variety of, of, of tools, including the funding, funding from the Affordable Requirements Ordinance, or ARO, uh, the HUD Veterans Affairs Support Housing Voucher Program, or VASH, and other philanthropic support. Again, these are a few of the housing projects that I called out. There are several additional senior housing and townhomes that have been developed as well, including 60 units of townhomes near 122nd and Ashland, and three additional senior homes over with over 50 units each. Our final category is the planning and future opportunity section of the presentation. West Pullman and the Greater Rosa neighborhoods represent about 20 square miles of land between 95th and city limits at 129th Street slash the Calumet River. With a population greater than most suburban cities and villages, these neighborhoods require extensive planning and development efforts that were a result of structural slash institutional racism and chronic disinvestment. To date, there are over $2 billion worth of planned projects on nearly 400 acres of land affecting over 100,000 residents who are predominantly African-American in low-income households. And these areas that are gonna be addressed are transit and mobility connection needs, retail, housing and wealth creation, health and wellness, and community confidence that have been further eroded by COVID-19 and accelerated the challenges in the neighborhood. That is why it's imperative that public and private partnerships, such as collaborations, are established and committed to long-term socioeconomic development and growth. These partnerships are noted in the presentation by Kevin Cathy of local, state, and federal governments coming together must not be restricted to, to political ideologies, but from a diversity of thought and compassion for people who are trapped in a cycle of poverty due to historical disadvantages. One way to address these historical disadvantages uh, is to bring access to public transportation to residents on Chicago's far south side that currently spends about 90 minutes traveling one way to work, especially for those who work outside the neighborhoods due to poor transit connections. One highlight is that the CTA Red Line 95th Street Station and Extension is a proposal by the Chicago Transit Authority, or CTA, to extend the Red Line from the newly renovated $240 million 95th Street Terminal at 95th uh, and the Dan Ryan to 130th Street. The proposed 5.6 mile extension will be elevated above the existing Union Pacific Railroad and will include four stations at 103rd Street in Eggleston, 111th Street in, in Stewart, 115th Street in Michigan Avenue, and 130th Street. Each station will include bus and parking facilities. The proposed site is estimated at a $1.9 billion, billion and will create economic opportunities such as jobs, residential, and retail developments near the terminals as part of Chicago's Equitable Transit Oriented Development Strategy, or ETOD. 
CTA is in the pre-development stages of gathering market studies, community stakeholder meetings, and acquiring land adjacent to the proposed terminal sites. Additionally, PACE is also developing a rapid bus transit redevelopment that extends from its, its base terminal in Harvey, Illinois, to 79th Street uh, along the South Halstead Corridor. PACE plans to build nearly 20 plus terminals along the route and partnering with CTA Metro to create intermodal transit terminals, which are terminals that involve more than one form of transit. The Rosen Medical District is a 100 acre designation under the Illinois Special Districts section in the state statute 70 ILCS 935 Rosen Community, Community Medical District Act that was signed into law by Governor Patrick Quinn in 2011 and is governed by a 12 appointed member commission board. The district whose, bo whose boundaries are north, which you see on the, on the map here, 112, 110th Street to south to 112th Street and to the west is Stewart Avenue and to the east is Michigan Avenue was created to attract and retain academic centers of excellence, viable healthcare facilities, medical research facilities, emerging high technology enterprises, and other facilities as, and uses as permitted by this act. There are only three medical districts in the state of Illinois with one Illinois medical district doing exceedingly well. The Rosen Medical District is anchored by the Rosen Community Hospital, which has well over 200 employees and provides healthcare services to residents reaching into the south suburbs. Currently, there is a comprehensive master plan underway funded by the city of Chicago, the existing conditions report was funded by Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, which was a local technical assistance program, which is federally funded. And also it received a $25 million allocation from the state of Illinois' Bill Illinois Bond Fund. If Rosa Medical District models after the Illinois Medical District, the district would generate billions in commerce and create thousands of jobs for, for the district and would lift majority of Rosen out of the low income status. The 115th and Halstead project known as Morgan Park Commons is a 12-acre former Jewel Food Store and Halstead Indoor Mall commercial site. In, in 2009, Jewel Food Store moved its operation to Marshfield Plaza, which is about four blocks southwest of this site, and the owner of the Halstead Indoor Mall filed bankruptcy, especially after the crash of 2008. Over the last 12 years, there have been various iterations of development concepts, including academic mix with housing, medical facilities, new retail, and even a call center. The latest concept opportunity has emerged is a mixed-use development of rental and townhome-style housing with a community center and no more than 20,000 square feet of retail. Once completed, the projected uh, project will cost $117 million to develop, will create hundreds of construction jobs and bring over 1,000 residents, ranging from 30% area median income to 120% area median income to occupy the nearly 390 units of, of, of housing. The 119th Street Corridor Plan completed in 2014. The plan was a community-driven process developed to develop strategies and implementation steps to build on the strengths of the, of the corridor and make improvements to anchor economic development, housing stability, and community identity and character along 119th Street between Interstate 57 and Union Avenue in West Pullman, in the West Pullman neighborhood. The project was funded by the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning and the, through the Local Technical Assistance Program for the City of Chicago in association with our organization, Tesco Associates, Jones Lang and LaSalle, Prism Engineering, and TNK Consulting. The plan focused on seven goals and objectives, economic development, job training and adult education, transportation, youth and family development, housing, cultural identity and design, and land use. I am proud to say that since the completion in 20, of the plan in 2014, several projects emerged afterwards, including the MyBath extension, West Home and Fire Station, some of the Habitat Home renovations, streetscape improvements, along 119th streets and improvements along the Major Taylor Trail. And lastly, the CalSAC con uh, Trail concept is a 26 mile trail stretching across the Chicago Southland from Indiana uh, and the Chicago Lakefront to Lamont, Illinois and the INM Canal Trail. More than 185,000 residents live within a, within a mile of the trail and will connect communities such as West Pullman to the Chicago Southland. The CalSAC Trail connects five regional multi-use trails, creating a Chicago Southland trail system that stretches more than 100 miles. The cost of the trails is 21 million, which 80% will be covered by the federal grants and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources contributed $1 million toward the construction. The trail links three marinas, three golf courses, and six nature and forest preserves. Some of the impacts we have seen through all this development were homeowners in West Pullman neighborhoods saw an increase in their home values of, of upwards of 22%. 60% of residents are located in highly walkable areas since all these developments take, have taken place. Household, households earning $50,000 or more 
uh, increased from 41% to 46% between 2006 and 2009. There was a 6% reduction in crime year over year. And West Pullman has a 76.1% workforce participation. I'm sorry, 76.1% workforce participation. Uh, and there's an A plus rating for local shopping, coffee, parks, restaurants, and groceries. As a few takeaway points, community collaboration with residents and, uh, and public private partnership institution is, was, is a must in order to formulate these partnerships and these projects. Persistent local leadership, the strength of the local leadership is important with uh, Alderman Kerry Austin uh, and, and uh, some of the state representatives and, and partners at the city of Chicago and aligning resources over the years to address past issues, current demands, and future opportunities. These are long-term commitments, and it requires a multi-level approach, and in, that includes public and private partnerships. And with that, I would like to thank you for allowing me to do this presentation. I'd like to turn it back over to Michael. Okay, thank you, Abraham, and thanks to all of the presenters today. And thank you to everybody in the audience who's already sent questions. Uh, we've gotten a number of them. You can continue to submit them to the questions tab here. And we're going to go in at least through the uh, end of the hour. I know we have folks, uh, our panel mostly is in the central time zone. We're in the eastern time zone and everybody's all over the place in the audience. So thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna ask our panelists to turn on their cameras so you can see them during this part of the uh, program and uh, thank you. Um, sometimes we have them on during the presentation, but we find that we get the feedback that folks would definitely wanna see the slides. So that's why we hold off to the end. And so I will say that we, kicking off this series, we're really looking forward to working with our colleagues at EPA, not only through today, but through the, uh, the next several programs. and. Uh, in, with keeping that in mind, we did get a number of general questions that were asked before we got into the detail, and I appreciate all the detail that you shared about what's been going on in Chicago. But I thought maybe we'll let's start at the bigger picture before we dive down into the details. And so I'm going to ask a question to Jim, which came up from a couple of our uh, audience members. To talk a little bit more about what a brownfield is and and what it means in the context that we're talking about here today. Yeah. So. Um, Brownfield is a, is a property that is not being redeveloped because of environmental concerns. It can be actual contamination or it can be a fear that contamination might exist on the property. Um, and there is a formal def definition of brownfields and it, it excludes Superfund sites, sites that are covered by other regulatory programs such as RECRA cleanup. Um, but it is, um, uh, so that is, uh, that is what brownfields are. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jim. Here's a question from Angela Lugo Thomas, who says, this reminds me so much of areas in my city of Highland Park, Michigan, and around the Detroit area. Will this series give us an opportunity to get assistance or mentorship with brownfield redevelopment? Highland Park just recently started a brownfield authority board, and I am new to all of this as a new community developer. That's a that's a great question. The um, um, uh, write us uh, at uh, you can write me at US EPA and we'll we can work to link you up uh, with people in the Detroit area and uh, and follow up with you on that. There's a lot of experience in Michigan and successfully redevelopment properties close to you, and so we can make those linkages. Great, thank you. And I definitely would encourage you to uh, attend our future programs as we move forward here. Um, here's a question for the panel from Elizabeth no Nowak, who says, uh, what were the biggest, the biggest educational challenges your teams faced in informing residents and stakeholders and in engaging different government offices and decision makers? And what recommendations do you have for others? Who wants to start with that one? Let, let me jump in there first, Jim. Um, it's it's a basic education of of, of people. Um, one huge difference between when we started this in the 90s and now is the internet. So everybody's going to do their own research, and you know some people think they're experts. And one of the things that you have to do is you have to um, 
be open with people and just educate, I mean, provide the information for folks out there. I mean, I think that's just the best way and uh, just be open with folks. I'd also like to add, I think that one of the, uh, something that was very helpful for this community was the EPA uh, worked with the residents in the Victory Heights Maple Park community and they provided technical assistance. I think it's TOSC, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, that is the um, technical outreach for community services. And what I think that did, um, it explained what was going on, it gave them knowledge, and I think um, it gave the community a license or an opportunity to vision. I think they saw that something is happening here, this is moving, um, they could see the other side. And at that point, they began to engage, I think, uh, the, the local elected officials and said, hey, what are we gonna do with this site? They're moving, this is gonna be, this is gonna be different for our community. What are we gonna do with it? And Kathy, you bring up a good point. It's, it's, it's as I mentioned in my closing remarks, that it's not just cleaning it up, it's also showing them what comes after, because that, mm -hmm. that garners excitement. Just cleaning up a piece of land, it's good, and people do appreciate that, but it's the other part. What can we do? Mm -hmm. What can we build together with this? So you can get what Abraham's been doing, so you can see all these slides years later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the other thing too is, you know, as Kevin and Kathy has mentioned and Jim, who all worked at the city, one of the things that's very convenient is, is it's, it's almost simplistic enough to say that get to know the people who work at the city, get to know the people who work at the local areas. I understand that the, the need is to, to first run to the local elected officials. They're, they're, they have numerous amounts of, of, of folks demanding them from every which angle. But one of the things that I found out that was very helpful is getting to know the people like Kevin and Kathy and Jim, who who their firsthand knowledge and they are, I would say, they're they're eager to assist in these things because this is their life's work. And so right. for for you to go to your local officials is great, but also ask them who's a connection at the city, at your city level, who's a connection at your department level, so that they have they can spend more time with you to be able to address the varying needs and, and even assist you even technically um, when it comes to addressing these various challenges that you're facing development-wise. And, and let me add one more thing coming from the other side of how I mentioned how I'm on a panel, I'm on a committee for my local community. And we have some folks who really, really did not trust the government. And um, the, current, the, the current Department of Environment, called um, now the um, Department of Access Information and Services, they reached out to the biggest skeptics on our community and really just sat down with them and discussed the environmental problems with this to give them comfort. It took a month or two, but it was really worth the time. Great, thank you all. Um, I'll note uh, before I ask the question that um, we do have an archive page on our smartgrowth.org website that will include the uh, information that we have on each of these sessions we're doing in this series, as well as the handouts and any other links and materials that the panelists would like to share. So uh, we'll be sending out an email afterward uh, once the uh, recording of today's uh, program is posted that will lead you to that page. And if we do get more information moving forward, we'll be posting it there. But in addition to that, I guess, Jim and others, um, one of our uh, members is asking uh, today if there are any um, other types of resources or documents or uh, books that you would refer folks to that are interested in learning more about this topic and, and what's going on in kind of the Brownfields realm right now. Abraham, what do you re, re, what do you rely upon as a source of information for the incredibly complex work that's involved in bringing these large projects forward? So um, some of the things that we have, I know, in the city is that we have different sort of research organizations, such as the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Um, we have the Metropolitan Planning Council. 
Um, there's active transit, active transportation. There's there's so many different groups that publish so much information in terms of uh, being able to assess this uh, statistics, so you don't have to go and restart the wheel or go and try to find it out yourself. Also, some of your city agencies have also published data uh, through their city data portal that can be able to uh, draw from in terms of getting this information. Um, the, and then you have some of the national companies if you're trying to find out about brownfields. I mean, the US EPA has a whole section on it. Um, you know, when it comes to different funding cycles, um, I think that you know, uh, you know, there's a great documentation on uh, new market tax credits and understanding what that means. Um, also, understanding what TIFs mean because, and you know, just googling TIFs is will give you every information uh, that that's plausibly possible, um, especially in Chicago. Everything is listed on the city of Chicago's website of what a TIF is and what it does. And even there are steps even uh, to try to even uh, work with your elected official to even forming one. If you're a local uh, community development personnel or you are a, an alderman or you are a city official that's looking to uh, spur economic development. So um, these tools are widely available. I mean, the Google search is great. Um, if you reach out to each one of us in our emails, um, we can send you links to various sort of uh, information regarding uh, different topic areas uh, addressing distressed um, uh, communities. Great, thank you. Uh, next question here is from Brian Reynolds who says, and again, it's more of a general question here. Are there legal tools or efforts for government to repossess property or require brownfield landowners and polluters to remediate and clean up their property? It seems like we often allow companies to pollute sites, hide and transfer profits, declare bankruptcy and walk away, leaving public taxpayers with the mess and cleanup bill. And here's a comment, society is paying a high cost for past mistakes, lacks oversight and regulations. Generally, I, I'll take a, a shot at the first part of that. Um, most municipalities have the, of course, ability to acquire properties through eminent domain. Um, in the city of Chicago, we have worked, and we worked at that time with the tax reactivation program, which allowed us to go after properties that were tax delinquent. Um, it seems that environmental, environmentally challenged, as I like to call it, and tax delinquent go hand in hand. So in many instances, when we were looking at a property, um, we were able to look at the tax status. We also um, searched our records to see if the city had taken any action on that particular site. Was there a demo done? Could we foreclose on a lien? Um, so you become very creative in um, finding ways to acquire property. Um, did I miss any? of the tools that no. we no kathy I, I think that's that's exactly right because as a community organ, uh, organization uh we've done a number of going to court to sort of really enforce to sort of push to get the property acquired either through a mm -hmm. land banking situation as kathy mentioned in her previous uh, uh presentation or the city itself would would do an eminent domain to to gather property we also have to remember mm -hmm. too a lot of these contaminated sites, you know, the ones I know that in Chicago, these contaminated sites date all the way, date hundreds of years back. I mean, you know, these things were going on in, in the 1890s through the 1920s and 30s. So there was not a lot of regulation at that time. There was not a lot of things to, to because, these, because folks thought these things were going to live forever. Um, it wasn't until 1970s and the 80s when these things kind of really started disappearing due to the sort of proliferation of, of of companies moving over their operations overseas. So a lot of these things we're addressing. And what the US EPA has done and what other municipalities have done, especially the city of Chicago, they put in standards for organizations and for companies who are trying to locate in, in, in these various areas um, with regards to design concepts, to design requirements, and to environmental uh, uh, statuses. Plus they also even offer to incentivize is different sort of tax breaks or tax incentives um, for for companies who are willing to 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 do lead construction, and so that therefore um, you're not concerned with uh, some of the, the the issues of the past, because like I said, these these past these past um, behemoths of of companies are, are no longer around, and they've been there for for decades. So we're just trying to right the wrongs of what took place 100 150 years ago. 
And I might throw in that from the federal government point of view, there's um, Congress created Superfund program in 1980, and that's designed to address the very, very worst contamination. And uh, so there, there are large sites that are the national priorities list sites, and that's one category of work, but the other is Superfund emergency response. And as we were working on these projects, when we encountered contamination that might be at a level that would really be too expensive for brownfields um, and, uh, and maybe needed to be removed immediately, that we contacted mm -hmm. US EPA and asked if they would come in and evaluate the site. And when they come in, they come in not just with money and, and you know, people to do work, they come in with an enforcement uh, uh, strategy. And so if there are viable parties that are present that could pay for it, um, then, then they sue them and force them to do the work. Otherwise, they would they go ahead and do the work and, and, and sue them later for triple damages. So this is a very strong motivation to go along with this, which was used heavily in this neighborhood. Um, in the three years I was at the city of Chicago, uh, there was $10 million worth of emergency response done, uh, done within, within Chicago, and there's been much done since. Um, Brownfields was created uh, to address a subset of sites which were not those emergency sites, um, but which were not being redeveloped due to concern about this Superfund liability. And so the Brownfields program carves out um, a set of, a set of um, typically smaller, less contaminated sites, which can be cleaned up through state voluntary cleanup programs. And um, uh, so large numbers of sites are cleaned up in this manner. There's about 16,500 sites a year that get cleaned up through these state voluntary cleanup programs nationwide. That's the answer. So, so, and let me just add one more thing. So, one of the key things about properties, if you're worried about it, to find out what the contamination is, and there's various ways. First, you do a record search of like old Sanborn maps and the like to see what historically was there. So then you could determine what the business was, and then you could determine what type of contamination there is. Um, after that, then we would do the we would do the sampling. For, we would do the sampling after that if we didn't think it was that bad. So it's a tier of what you can do before you go to the federal government. I mean, the US EPA, as Jim mentioned, they have programs for larger tier projects, but a lot of the brownfields are really, it, it could be perception for all we know. It could just be, you clear the topsoil off and you're good to go. I mean, or mm -hmm. I mean, it, so it's something that, it's something that you really, it's a different tier and just do your research. And like Jim said, the federal government's there to help. So I'm going to say Kathy Brown didn't get to give her uh, lessons learned, and so here's well, your chance, Kathy. I, I sometimes folks ask why did all of this work, and I have to say that um, in this instance there was political leadership, and in Chicago that's a little bit different than what um, I, I, than what I have found because I've worked in several other cities and states, and it's a little bit different and. You start at the local level um, and with the alderman. And as mentioned, we had a very, very driven local alderman and chief of staff, uh, Alderman Kerry Austin and Chester Wilson. And then you get down to the block clubs. And those are the folks that organized in the West Pullman um, area, the, the Victory Heights and Maple Park communities. Uh, you have the churches. and. You, you know, you even get down to the precinct captains that live on the blocks. And um, each and every time um, we presented something, um, we presented a proposal for a TIF. We changed the use from commercial or suggested use from commercial to industrial. We were brought before the community. I mean, it was a process. Um, and we included that uh, input into the plan. I mean, we were questioned, am I correct, Kevin? Um, we were questioned as to why. Why is this block there? Why is that block not there? Why are you uh, uh, drawing the line for the TIF at the alley? You know, why are you including my house there? You know, it may be as simple as, you know, the houses or the first few lots adjacent to the industrial site may suffer the, the blighting effects that the industrial park did. But I mean, we were forced to, and we were asked to explain. So I think that, makes this a very, very unique uh, situation. If you recall, when I started, um, when I met 
the the local ele local elected official, we were asked to do commercial. And when we came back and said, you know, you got to look at industrial. This is just there's no other place on the south side where you have this. You know, the 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 land mass, the the infrastructure, the the rail access, the um, proximity to the interstate. Um, the alderman said, try. And then she brought me right out to the community <laughs> to explain that. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. She's like, OK. Um, and um, it was a wonderful experience um, because I think in this instance, you know, some of the folks in the community had worked in this area. They were not afraid of industrial. They just wanted to see what modern industrial looked like. Um, also, I think here you have multiple layers of government that were working together. Um, you had state representatives that were working for this project. You had state senators that were working for this project. Um, both Abraham and myself, we mentioned the Pullman, West Pullman Library. It was a $4 million library. Um, I think this, the, the state senator um, worked to help us get $2 million for that project. Um, you have a Cook County commissioner here. So um, if there's such a thing as being vertically integrated in an organization, I think you had that in this area. Um, and you also had the EPA. I cannot um, say enough how much the community outreach assistance um, assisted us as the city as we went out to the communities because um, folks had a sense, again, that redevelopment was possible. Um, they knew what was going on on specific sites and they weren't looking at us like we had three heads and, you know, like we, we want to redevelop this site, you know, and they weren't saying it's glowing in the dark. No. Uh, so I can't emphasize enough how helpful that was. And again, uh, going back to the Brownfields Initiative, that framework that was established, that interdepartmental framework, um, planning, identifying the sites, Department of Environment, um, looking at the environmental history of the sites and working with um, the IEPA and the EPA, the law department um, and the building department. Kevin, I, if you recall, many times we got into a building not because there was some, because of the Department of Environment's enforcement ability, we got in there with the building inspector. Building inspector, right. Building inspector got us in. So there was tremendous um, work and, and, and if we couldn't get into a site, I'm thinking of the Carroll Street property, we brought the building inspector with us, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and the barrels of ooze. <laughs> hmm? And the barrels of ooze. Yes, yes, we did, we did. Um, and then there's private sector. Um, I think, you know, the Croc Center is the best example in this community of public-private partnership, you had, you know, not only the, the uh, Joan Kroc Foundation, the Salvation Army, but you had um, several CDEs, community development entities that came in and they, they, they floated the tax credits on this deal. So, I mean, you had the City of Chicago Department of Housing, you had Cener, you had Park National Bank, um, and you had the consortium. So, you had folks after this effort saying, uh, and I think the signal to the community that this is possible. Great, thank you. Um, so we've already gone over a little bit and I think we'll continue to ask a few more questions given the interest level today and the number of questions we received. I'll also note uh, for those who are looking for more resources, uh, there is obviously the epa.gov forward slash brownfields website that has a lot of information. And uh, we'll talk more about this as we move forward in the series, but in some ways this series is built around the upcoming 2021 National Brownfields Training Conference in December. And we'll actually have a final session after that to kind of look at all the lessons learned. But I did want to ask a couple more questions before we ended today, since we had gotten many great ones as we always do and we're never able to get to them all. Uh, this one is from Michelle Portier, who says, these are great projects. I'm sure they've added a lot to the vitality of the neighborhoods they're located in. Is there any data on whether there's been any gentrification in these areas post-construction? I ask because I'm interested in ways to do these projects with less displacement. Do you have any best practices to share? 
I'll take a I'll take a stab at this one first. Um, the you know we hear that a lot, and especially you know it, it's you know you, it, it depends on your location. Um, in our community in West Pullman in the Greater Rosa neighborhood, um, gentrification displacement does not occur. Um, reason for that is because we're not dealing with gentrification and displacement. We're dealing with depopulation. And, and that is due to, you know, many different uh, scenarios, whether it's dealing with schools or you're dealing with, uh, you know, an aging population or you're dealing with younger folks not coming back to the community. Um, but there's large swaths of land and in, in property uh, that is available for development. So um, I would be happy to say that, you know, I, I would be shocked to find that there will even be more than any one or two percent of displacement or gentrification that would ever have taken place into uh, into this into our neighborhoods because it just never really happened. Um, so the best practices is is that one you have to look at you know the, and the other reason why you don't experience displacement because of our proximity to the city the city core. So since we're at the the tail end of the city. Um, you don't really have to be concerned too much with uh, of the depopulation, I mean, of the displacement. When you go further into this, the city's core, it gets a little bit more denser, um, and then you get a little bit more of a, of a higher demand in terms of, uh, of property values and development, which you're seeing occur in, in various spots on the, the more northern portion of the, of the south side, like the Bronzeville or Hyde Park uh, neighborhoods. Um, but when you're coming this far, far south, you know we're welcoming development, and we're and everything we're trying to do is pull more residents to the community, um, and, and not even have to even be thought the thought of not even dealing with gentrification hasn't even crossed our minds, um, because that's how much the need is when you're covering about 20 square miles of of area of an area that includes both West Pullman and the Greater Roseland neighborhoods um, that uh, that surrounds it. So um, to answer your question, it, it just really depends upon uh your location and in proximity to your core um as well as uh you know the the level of, of vacancies that you have within your within your target area neighborhood if you could say what is the percentage of african-american population in this neighborhood and how has that changed over the last 30 years oh so you know uh it wasn't until really the 1960s that the west pullman neighborhood actually started getting uh african-american uh residents to the neighborhood for a long period of time, a lot of these uh, industrial companies, as well as developers, would literally block African Americans from buying homes. It, there would be no, they couldn't get uh, loans to buy a home. And also the jobs in the neighborhood would not even hire. So it wasn't until 1960s when you start seeing the first settled African Americans move into the West Pullman area. And it wasn't because, and the, the reason, primary reason was, is because it was ending the, uh, we were ending the World War II. So you start seeing, more uh, migration, um, and that the federal government actually mandated that they couldn't, um, they could not keep out African Americans from the neighborhood. Uh, in the 1980s, that number went up to 94% in terms of African American uh, uh, residents moving into the West Pullman neighborhood. Um, and right now, it was one of the West Pullman was one of the largest areas, uh, community areas in Chicago that had mm -hmm. black homeowner home ownership. We are still hovering around 61% in terms of home ownership, which is one of the highest in the city. And so one of the things that we're, we're challenged with is that you still have some of the age uh, population from that time period. And so the goal is, is to try to attract younger, um, younger uh, uh, families to the neighborhood um, and also a little bit of diversifying the housing stock because it was a lot harder. It's a lot harder now to get a, to get a home than it was back in uh, even surprisingly back at that time because of all the different requirements that you have to go through now. So, um, and then on top of that, you had a, you know, majority of West Pullman is a working class, working and middle class. So um, that's a great accomplishment because of all the industry that's not only surrounds West Pullman, but also in the Pullman neighborhoods and also in, including in some of the South suburbs. Great, thank you. I'm just going to ask a couple more before we wrap. Um, next one here is, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges you've experienced with getting community buy-in to support these Brownfields projects? I think, um, I honestly think that the groundwork 
that the EPA did um, in addressing, as they were addressing International Harvester and Dutch Boy, kind of paved the way for us a little bit, um, at least as we went out with redevelopment plans for uh, the TIF within the TIF district. I think that that helped us tremendously. Um, again, it's a matter of seeing or knowing what's possible and knowing what's there. Um, not being fearful that you're going to step outside and there's lead going that there, there's going to be lead on your front lawn, um, or something's going into. I think Kevin, you mentioned that you had to call the water metropolitan water reclamation yeah, district. That, yeah, yeah, that yeah. that that was a that was a big concern. It's legitimacy. I mean, uh, we were discussing and um, about this yesterday. I mean, the community was very very worried now that in West Pullman that we were coming. And as I mentioned, I was oversaw the um, environmental monitoring of a site. I mean, I mean the community, you had community members come out there every day. They pushed us to do air monitoring. And back in the 90s, it was quite expensive because everything wasn't computerized then. I mean, they had the water reclamation district, which is, you know, sewer, kind of the regional sewer agency here in Northeastern Illinois. You know, they had me open manhole covers to make sure things weren't going bad. And again, it was to, it was to get the comfort from them. And I must say, with US EPA involved, it gave a legitimacy to whatever we were doing because they, everyone then trusted the federal government much more than they trusted us. I mean, we did have a track record of working on the pilot sites and we came in and we could point to what we did there. But uh, in West Pullman, having the US EPA helped a whole lot. And I'd also like to say you don't see the type of industry that West Pullman had, the harvesters, the Dutch boys, um, the U.S. gear, you typically don't see that as a part of modern industry now. I mean, when folks think of industry, they think of storage and um, uh, storage facilities or distribution centers or, um, you know, hydroponic facilities. They're, they're really not afraid of the, um, of something like a, a, an international harvester or Navistar coming in. Uh, anymore. You just typically don't see that. I mean, so industrial parks are a lot cleaner. Um, infrastructure is yeah. a lot cleaner. Yeah. I just will throw in one last thing is the early uh, community engagement was structured very consciously so that it would not just be the loudest voices who are heard. And there, the outreach was, was, was structured so that there were many different categories of types of people at the table, types of organizations, and um, they committed to coming every month to the meeting and they built knowledge over time and they reported back to their individual groups. And, um, and this, was, this was a very nice model. And, and I'll add the last point is that you also got to think in terms of that the community had a good local leader that was transparent and was able yeah. to build that trust over time. If you're not, if your local leader is has not gained rapport from the community, the community is going to be ten times more skeptical of mm -hmm. anything that the government does, especially involving tax money. So, but when you have when you have a local leader like you know Alderman Kerry Austin, you have some of the state reps like Senator Neil Jones, they they are the ones that really communicated not only the transparency in terms of what the process was to the community, but they also translated that into the city level too as well. Um, when you're, you're talking in terms of the mayor's office and the city departments as well. So having that local leadership, being able to build that rapport with the community is is tantamount to, is part of the major successes that, you know, seen over uh, for West Pullman. And I can't, I want to, I want to say again, um, <clears throat> every proposal that we presented to the local elected officials, um, we were brought out to the community to explain um, every every um, ward meeting or wh whatever it be at a church at whatever we um, it, it that was just you built that into the process because the project was not going to move without that and without getting the buy-in. Great, thank you. Um, given where we are on the time i think we'll cut off the questions right now but i did have i think one last one for jim both uh the takeaway from this as well as kind of looking forward to the next uh number of sessions that we're going to be doing in this series and that is i guess 
given your experience, Jim, in this community as well as others, uh, what are some of the key takeaways that you see that other communities can can borrow from the experience that we've shared today? And then I'll just uh, add to that if you want to go ahead and segue into your closing thoughts and moving forward uh, as well, uh, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, so, uh, you know, one thing that should be obvious from these presentations is that Chicago, in, in, in the city of Chicago and nonprofits were able to attract very highly talented people to work on on projects such as this. And this is a this is a um, this is a key takeaway. Um, also, the um, the political leadership was constant over a long time and kept pushing the projects forward at multiple levels. And so uh, this is uh, another important a part, important lesson learned from my perspective. But um, uh, to come back here 25 years later and see what's been done in this community, it's very, very heartwarming. And um, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Oh, should I give the closing remarks? Yeah, if you want to just kind of maybe talk a little bit about what we're going to be looking at in the coming weeks. So uh, as we look forward to new investments in brownfields and infrastructure, uh, we can learn from this example. But the initial investment is just part of the story. The long-term perseverance and determination of the local leadership kept, kept a steady flow of investments into the structure and quality of life of this neighborhood. And this is something that is that is uh, made very visible improvement and change in this neighborhood, which at the start, um, it, the, it was a neighborhood of nice houses with ruins of old industry, just laying there in piles in the middle of the neighborhood and a very shocking situation really and, and dramatic change. Our next webinar will be also another Chicago story focusing on the Woodlawn neighborhood and the role of churches and nonprofit leadership. It'll be September 8th at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. This will be followed by stories from Boston, Indianapolis, and Gary, Indiana, and one with a focus on health impact assessment tools. Several of these stories were inspired by smart growth discussions over the years, specifically transit-oriented development around rail stations and a bike trail in Indianapolis and um, equitable development along a train line. So we'll look forward to the next sessions and thank you so much to our speakers. Great, thanks, Jim. And thanks again to everybody who submitted questions today. We're not able to get to them all, but we will share them with the panel and take a look at them in case there's some application for the upcoming programs as well. This will conclude our webinar today, building upon large-scale roundfield reinvestments to benefit communities. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to our panelists for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru, who helps to make this all happen and answers your technical questions during the program. The complete report Recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email, especially if you need that to claim other credits other than AICP. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And finally, keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars, including the next webinars in this series. The next one will be in September, so we'll be sending that out shortly. And with that, I wish you all a great day.